Well, welcome everybody to another Future Beauty Talk. I'm Frank Sellum, the CEO of Vital Plus, and I am thrilled to host another talk with Pia Kynock. Um, today, Pia is going to discuss the importance of our nervous system. And like many of you, Pia uh, started her journey as a beauty therapist. She has, however, expanded her knowledge by studying things like neuro, uh, natural therapy, cornea therapy, nutrition, uh, NLP, lymphatic uh, massage, yoga, qigong, reiki. My God, she's a showing off uh, uh, mindfulness, breath work, acupuncture. That's enough. I think that's enough. Uh, enough showing off here. <laughs> no, it's it's a, a, absolutely impressive bio. And, um, and I'll put it over to you. And thank you again for being here with us. Uh, thanks, Frank and team for inviting me. That was a great introduction. I feel really honored to be here for the people who are live or some familiar faces or, or names uh, and to all the people watching the recording. Thank you. And yes, I guess my journey has taken me across many different places to get to this point of um, sharing this education that I'm offering today. And I did create this presentation, especially for Frank and Vital Plus, because I already have a lot of information in the nervous system course that I've already created about the nervous system. And what I wanted to do was open up some different perspectives and some different thought processes and potentially introduce you to some new ideas and some new understandings of your own. And therefore, you know, that relationship that that might be held in other people like your clients or your team yeah. or your, yeah. you know, your um, educators, like there's all sorts of relationships that are made between our nervous system and the spaciousness or not that's in there. And I'm sure that each, every single person watching this or hearing this is gonna know that feeling of complete overwhelm, stress, anxiety, not being able to do it, wanting to run away and hide or overdoing mm -hmm. all over yourself. Yeah. And they're all signs and symptoms of a dysregulated nervous system. And it's really interesting because initially when I um, went and started my naturopathy degree, it was because I was so fascinated with what was happening in the gut and I do have you know, a huge um, course on the gut and I like it's still the most amazing um, mm. organ system to understand, especially in relationship to the skin. However, what drives the digestive system is our nervous system and it is the master regulator of every aspect of our being and there's just so much instant communication happening all the time. And one of the things that you may or may not be aware of, but when we're in embryonic stage, at that very first time of cell differentiation that happens about two weeks after the embryo um, has, you know, like the sperm and the egg have met and started fertilizing. There's like little cell divisions that happen. The cells are pluripotent, which means that they haven't quite decided what their cell lineage is yet. It's a really miraculous stage of life that science still doesn't quite understand. But when there is a differentiation that starts happening, the skin and the nervous system divide from the same cell lineage. And so there's such deep, primitive long-time connections between what's happening on our skin like the touch processes the looking at it processes like our skin is an extension of our nervous system and I think it needs to be classified as such by all people in you know any kind of body or skin therapy trades and understanding your kind of I guess, responsibility awareness of that and how you can interact with it in even deeper ways because one of my other fascinations is with why we are so sick and diseased, even though our populations of people are getting older, we've got so much medical technology, or there's so many advances in science, and yet we're getting sicker and sicker than ever before. Like one in eight Aussies are living with a chronic disease. Like we're not a well community, like medicalization, you know, pharmaceutical prescriptions, they're all at their highest that they've ever been. And particularly after COVID, like mental stress, um, you know, and immune system stress are the highest that they've ever been. And, you know, with all of these advances, what are we missing? <laughs> and I really do think it's that very deep understanding of how to communicate properly, effectively, like in a relationship with our own nervous system and therefore being able to offer that to others. The topic of today was how does learning about our own nervous system help us to master, you know, our own lives and our professional growth? And I'm sure that in terms of, you know, our profession, all of us have found at some stage or maybe at all stages that navigating the world of skin therapy is kind of noisy. <laughs> there's a lot of different opinions. There's a lot of different nuances. There's a lot of different way forward. It can be pretty confusing and sometimes pretty underwhelming. 
what I really do know though is to become like when we're becoming exceptional in our beauty therapy role, skin therapist role, holistic skin therapist, dermal therapist role, you really do have to go above and beyond the skills and awareness of the ordinary beauty therapist. And I applaud you for being here and for connecting today. I really do. And I really love our skin. I love all of our body. I, I really do specialize in human body interconnectedness. But our skin is so complex. There's so many layers to it. And it is managing the relationship between us and the outside world 24-7. And there's so much of it that we're aware of, that we think we are, but there's so much going on with our skin that we're not aware of. And this, I love, I put this quote in because it's just so perfectly succinctly said. It provides information that allows us to analyze, examine, and monitor its status, like our whole organism's status to understand and to know the world the skin can appear as a canvas on which a large part of our interior world is painted it is a dynamic structure in continuous transformation that expresses subjective physiological contents through which emotions take shape so demonstrated consistently through patient reported outcomes aesthetic procedures have substantial impacts on metrics way beyond anatomic improvements and aesthetic correction. And this is from an article just from last year, the aesthetic interventions and the perception of the self. What, they, what, the, what, what the research has found is that as one's appearance changes, the perception of the self and others may change, which often influences our cognitive dialogues, intrapsychic world, our functional status, and many of our lifestyle choices. In many populations, these interventions can ultimately be life-saving. That's what we are in the industry of. And it can be life-saving, but it can also, when it's not, um, I guess, done in the best ways possible, it can also be transforming in a negative way. And the responsibility, as I said before, is really, um, it is something that we are here to show up for. And we're, we're all showing up in the best ways that we can, but understanding our own nervous system and how it's working and the fact that skin is not separate from the mind, our body is not separate from our mind, you know, like we are our whole body. There is a wholeness of self that does need to come into our understanding of the world and that we do know and experience the world through our skin, like through this boundary of our body. But our skin is dealing with our whole internal world experience as well as our external world experience. It's doing a huge, huge job. And so... It is the ultimate barrier and I think it can be viewed as a representation of the health of our combined world, our external world and our internal worlds. And so, you know, the questions to ask is like, is it vital? Is it radiant? Is it glowing? Is it smooth? Is it non-reactive? Is it cared for? Is it loved? Is it appreciated? And if it's not, what does that, what is that indicating about that person? Where are the gaps? How big are the gaps and how can we make an impact to those gaps? And so we, we do have an amazing nervous system in our skin. It is literally an active sensory interface. Um, and so it's classified as our peripheral nervous system. And we've got our central nervous system, our brain, our spinal cord. We've got our peripheral nervous system, which is divided into our somatosensory and our autonomic um, systems and you can think of our autonomic system as like our automatic things that we don't really have heaps of control over that are really happening without much of our awareness most of the time and that's to do with our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems I'm sure you've heard of them before and it's the somatosensory nervous system that's detecting these environmental and internal stimuli and working out is it a threat or is it a friend you know like can I work with this or do I need to do something about it so every single division of our parasympathetic nervous system is able to communicate with immune cells. I really want to make this so clear across today. I'm going to bring it up a couple of times. And immune cells express receptors for many classes of neurotransmitters, which basically just means nerve signaling agents. And so I'm not going to dive into like all of the deep science around all of these nerves. It's just really important that you understand that the communication that's happening between our nervous system, between what's happening on the surface of our skin. So we can change the signaling that's happening within the surface of the skin, depending on what we're applying to the skin, like what treatments we're choosing, what massage pressure we're choosing, 
um, that's just part of how we are communicating with the nervous system when we're working with clients one-on-one. -on -one. And of course, I do have written here that we are continuously emitting waves, particles, and energy. Like science does know that we emit light particles. Like that's that we are made, you know, at our basic unit of energy of atomic waves and particles. And that we are actually always interacting with our air, our water, the light, all the other frequencies in our environment all the time. So how you are choosing to set up your workspace, how you're choosing to be within your workspace, how you're choosing to integrate your client's treatment within your workspace. They're all really important things, like how are you activating your senses? You know, like what are the lights like? Is there plants? What, what colors have you used? What textures, what fibers, what materials? All of that plays a role in the messaging that's coming from our skin through the nervous system. And so what else did I want to say about these nerve cells? Oh, I did also want to say that neuroimmune or nerve immune interactions are found across multiple organs. Like this is, I mean, it's across our entire body. It's not just happening in our skin that this nervous immune um, sensing is happening all the time. And science, it's really only been over the last kind of five, maybe seven years, which is a small amount of time in the scientific literature, that they are being, like it's being classified, neuroimmunology has now got its own field um, because it's been discovered as such an important regulator of our overall physiology. They used to be studied as completely separate entities, like our nervous system, our immune system, our skin system. And now finally science is coming to the point where it has slightly a more holistic perspective where it's understanding that they are actually weaving in all together all the time. And it is really important that they are interwoven together all the time in terms of understanding how they're working because the reaction to the stimuli and the transmission of a signal that might be coming in with neurons, with our nervous system, performs on a time scale of milliseconds. Our immune system, it's going to happen in minutes to hours. So we need to have both of them combining and communicating and collaborating to co-evolve so that we can be healthy. And I also just want to keep in mind, and if you've ever heard me speak before, you know that I'll talk about the 13 systems of the body, not just the 11 classically you know, um, spoken about anatomical systems. I talk about our microbiome as being one of our body systems and our energy as being one of our other body systems. Like we cannot live without any of those systems. Um, and so our, the composition, the diversity, the numbers of our microbiota anywhere on our body, not just on our skin, will influence obviously all sorts of physiological processes, including immune function, including nervous system function, including development of our whole body, metabolism in our whole body. And that's why dysfunction in our microbiome, in our nervous system, in our immune system, they're going to have really significant flow on effects. It's going to leave us or our client susceptible to ongoing inflammation, ongoing disorders, ongoing diseases in their bodies. And I also just want to bring back to your awareness that our microbiota can also modulate our emotions and our behaviors. And that's obviously part of our central nervous system, our brain, and that social activity. Like how, how do we feel in terms of our connection and engagement in our community? What are our stress levels like? What are our anxiety-related responses? Our microbiota are linked to really diverse neuropsychiatric disorders and neuropsychiatric disorders can be linked to skin disorders. So all of these things are really interwoven and are really important for you to consider, especially when it comes to skin wound healing and how well the skin can get there because it's such a complex and dynamic biological process. You know, skin wound healing involves so many different cell types. We have to have a really healthy extracellular matrix. And there's a whole new, you know, range of scientific literature coming out just about the extracellular matrix. There's all sorts of different mediators, so many different cellular signaling molecules, you know, like things like neuropeptides, growth factors, cytokines, interleukins, all sorts of things. And so we can have diseases of our central nervous system, but we can also have issues with our neurovascular system as well like what's happening within our vascular system as kind of connected with to the messaging of our nervous system 
And that actually plays a pivotal role in skin wound healing. And again, the interlinking of systems, you cannot look at one separately from the other. And so this tissue homeostasis and protection of our skin, like the maintenance of our skin, really relies crucially on collaboration and connection between all of our systems. And as I said at the beginning, our nervous system is the director of that. It is the master regulator of what's going on within all of our systems. Sensory neurons are definitely key instigators of skin inflammation. And that's just because neurons have this very fast millisecond ability to directly sense danger signals. Those danger signals could be coming from our perception of the world, which is a really big thing, like our beliefs about the world, our beliefs about people, our automatic judgments when we walk into a room, whether we're hyper vigilant, whether we're completely overwhelmed, we can't even, we don't even care anymore, like what environment we're in. We're on automatic kind of obedient behaviors. Like we're just following the ticks in our diary. Like we're just getting through our day. We're not actually taking any notice of our environment. All of those things can change signaling to every other system in our body, including our skin. It's because of this integration of signals happening all the time that are changing our tissue integrity. They're changing our skin and other organ defense strategies. They're changing our microbiome populations. And What's kind of amazing is that there are some amazing recent studies that demonstrate the ability of neural stimulation, like direct nervous system stimulation, to significantly reduce the severity of different types of immunopathology and consequently reduce mortality, like death rates. And it's led to a pretty big resurgence in the field of neuroimmunology. So you're going to see a lot more information about, like I'm not going to break down this slide that I've put in here on the left, but this sort of signaling is becoming more and more apparent. It's um, science is working out the specific pathways that are involved. Um, the vagus nerve is something that I've spoken about many, many times over. I do talk about it in my nervous system course. This is a huge controller of what's going on. And that's a lot of time where nervous system processing, um, people have no awareness of what's happening with their breath rate, with their heart rate, with their saliva flow, with like the internal signaling that are happening in their body. That's called interoception. And again, I talk about that heaps more in my nervous system course. There's too many things for me to unpack today. So I'm going to just keep moving with the slides that I have. And I'm going to come back and check questions later. I just want to remind you that as I'm going, if things come up for you, please let me know. And so with this kind of nervous system and immune system response, what we also, what science now also knows that there was a 2021 paper that showed that the brain's insular cortex region, and I've got a photo in here because it's really deep in our brain, like these are little hooks that they're showing are holding, you know, parts of the left um, temporal lobe apart so that you can see that the insular is deep, deep in our brain tissue. And that stores and retrieves and can reawaken specific immune responses and that will depend on context cues such as our interpretation of threat, of pain, of emotions, of memories, of interpersonal connection. So that sounds very emotional, yeah? So when we are interacting with our life and we're overlaying it with our current set of beliefs and values and, um, and the trauma that's held in our nervous system that we might be unaware of, but that's held in our body, that can overlay a lens on the insular cortex that makes the world seem more threatening and it will instigate more of an immune response just as a natural defense protective mechanism. And that's really different to like the historical concept of immunological memory, which basically has always been like the immune cells activate the neuronal representations that then activate the inflammatory information. And so now, I mean, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Like this is really bi-directional. And as I said before, this is happening really fast, like in the space of milliseconds. And this is where an understanding and a connection to the responses of your own body, understanding what your nervous system is telling you kind of moment to moment, hour to hour, day by day. It's only with this knowledge that you can start really regulating your response to the world in a conscious, aware, directive way that can actually change your habits, change your energy, change your life. <laughs> um, and this is also why the skin is harboring one of the most sophisticated sensory networks in our body because of the work that it's doing for us to be our barrier to the world. 
to be our connection point to the world, to be our boundary of our internal world and our external world. And that's why partly it's also so cute, so complex, and it is related to what's happening with our microbiomes and our hormonal systems and our cardiovascular systems. And so why I wanted to bring this into the point to your attention as well is that vibration and skin stroking can activate areas in all parts of the insula, then that makes nervous system informed touch a true tool in a client treatment strategy. Like it's huge. This is new, brand new scientific information. And it's really huge for what we are doing in our industry, what we are capable of, the level of attunement we can have for our clients, the long-term health changes that we could create if we have a deeper level of knowledge about what we're actually creating when we're touching people, when we're serving people, when we're with people. This is a really big thing. And so I hope this point has landed for you. Really what I wanted to say is that basically our brain can recall and reawaken past immune responses, things that have already happened in our body at another time and date depending on the present moment cues of interpretation that it has currently available to it. So we can have thoughts, emotions, and an awareness or unawareness of our own body's interceptive, you know, sensations, physicality, movement. That interceptive power is related to our autonomic nervous system, our sensory input system, and all of this changes and initiates real physiological processes and so when we've got inflammation that's been induced signals from this part of the brain the insular cortex are going to be helping to determine the severity and think about your clients that have had perioral dermatitis acne atopic dermatitis psoriasis when they have changes in their skin presentation even like um, accelerated aging you know like uh when was it, it would have been about a year and a half ago now, I completely burnt out, like maybe it was two years ago, um, in the first kind of COVID shutdowns that happened in Melbourne. And I moved, I'd renovated a house, and I had so much stuff happening. I, had, I was unstable, unstable in every domain, every area of my life. I was feeling kind of disconnected from myself. I didn't really know exactly what was happening in, in any facet of, of my life. And my physical output at that particular time was just enormous. It was too big. I moved to a 160 acre property. It was, there was just so much happening. And I might be accelerated aging that my body went through was huge, was so big. It was nothing that I, like I had, I had never dealt with that in my own body before. And it shocked me to be in that place. And I also learned a lot from it. That was actually part of what catapulted me into more of this nervous system work. Because the skin is definitely a target organ for systemic as well as local reactions to stress. Like it, it changes everything. It changes so many parts of that, you know, that first slide that I showed you, like the way that we look at ourselves in the mirror and how comfortable we feel in the skin that we in changes everything. It changes all of our interactions with people. It changes the way that we interact with our dreams in the world, whether we even believe that we can get our dreams fulfilled anymore. And so, again, it's like we, we are in this game of having an ability to really transform people's lives. And I think, again, as I mentioned in the first slide or the second slide, the prevalence of psychiatric comorbidities in dermatology, it's long been reported to be at least 30%. It's higher than that now. Like it's the psychiatric comorbidities in all domains since COVID began in the world has risen dramatically. So you know, maybe we'd be looking at 40%, maybe we'd be looking at 50%, maybe even higher. What science also knows is that body dysmorphic disorder symptoms are much more prevalent in patients with dermatological conditions than the general population. So their interoception is going to be out. Their autonomic nervous system control is going to be out. Their insular processing of um, like social behaviors, like their, their self-compassion is not going to be there. Their um, internal connection is not going to be there. Therefore, their interpersonal connection is not going to be there. So this insular cortex is going to have an ongoing threat response happening. There's going to be activating immune signaling, nervous system signaling through their peripheral, which means their skin. And in fact, in a review exploring the epidemiology of psychiatric illness related to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there was a scientist, Hossein and more, that 
um, reported a hugely increased prevalence in anxiety disorders, depression, PTSD, sleep disorders, somatic symptoms, and even suicidal behaviours, like really similar to those observed in populations following natural disasters. What the world's been through in the last couple of years is huge, and we all just need to have a listen to our body and find out whether we are we, have we taken enough notice of that, that impact of that for me, for my body, for my life? And let alone before you start reaching out to other people and looking out for them and, and checking in with them. You know, it's like that whole analogy of being on a plane. If the plane's going down and the oxygen masks come down, if you don't get your own oxygen first and you don't look after your own breathing, you're actually not going to be able to help other people breathe. You're just going to die pretty quickly. <laughs> and so our nervous system health and the health of our own self-care, again, becomes so much more important. And partly because of the memories that are stored in this insula and the way that we can be empathic, compassionate, and the way that we can gain interpersonal connection to a much more powerful level when we are. And so Stephen Porges, who's one of the um, great masters that I have learned uh, a lot from, who is a PhD scientist, he came up with the polyvagal theory as a scientific hypothesis for the nervous system in the 70s. They've done a lot of research on it since then. But one of the quotes that I love from him is that social communication and the ability to co-regulate another via reciprocal social engagement systems leads to a sense of deep connectedness. And this is a defining feature of the human experience. Like this is a core value of the human experience is connection. We all share the need to be seen and understood. We all long to deeply belong and to also experience ourselves within the context of loving, nurturing relationships. And the, the practitioners of all kinds, I think that the therapeutic relationship is truly a sacred one. And the older that I'm getting and for anyone that's been in the industry for a while, perhaps you might feel the same. Like it's, it's a really huge gift to have another person sitting with you like in close connection to that you're looking after and caring. It's a huge honour. And being invited in by this person, like this client, this patient, to share in their, their vulnerabilities, their traumas, their fears, their anxieties, you know, like their current health conditions, like what's happening for them in this moment and all of the stress that long-term health issues can bring about. It's such a privilege and absolutely one of the things that I've, thrown a huge amount of focus on with my education is that childhood issues you know from you know perinatal prenatal you know young childhood onwards can betray our trust in others and it can impair our ability to form healthy relationships as adults and some I, I always thought my whole life that I could form healthy relationships with others it wasn't until I started diving deeper and deeper into my nervous system that I was like oh wow <laughs> there's room for so much more and what there was room for so much more of was my understanding of myself. And I have written on the right-hand side of this slide, you cannot be an anchor if you yourself are untethered, unbalanced, overwhelmed, or exhausted. And part of what we're doing with our clients is practicing co-regulation. That means our own nervous system is regulated in a way that allows that client to open up and experience more of the healing that's available to them by the messaging that's happening in their central nervous system, in their peripheral nervous system, in their immune system, with their microbiome communities, with their hormonal systems, with their cardiovascular systems. And so there is a window of tolerance as well that is really important to know about. And basically for someone who comes to your practice or even you yourself, if you are, wake up in the morning and you're feeling dysregulated, if you're feeling untethered, unbalanced, overwhelmed, exhausted, um, you know, if you're really irritable, if you're feeling defensive, if you have um, all of a sudden had a surge of addictions come up or, you know, like you're binge watching TV or you're eating too much chocolate or whatever the things are, like there's so many different signs and symptoms of a dysregulated nervous system. Your window of tolerance will change depending on all of those factors, like how much sleep you've had, et cetera. And so that might change the intensity and range of sensations, emotions, conversations that your patient, your client can tolerate before their nervous system actually becomes dysregulated. And without you understanding your own regulation of your nervous system, it's really hard to know that, to spot that, to be able to tell that. And when we ourselves can't self-regulate, 
you know, be, we're, we're going to have a lack of inner resources. You know, we are going to be struggling with that overwhelm. We're not going to be able to think as clearly and we're not going to be able to serve people as clearly. Like that's just the, the natural after effect. And so what happens if we're like that is that it erodes some of the trust that we might have built with clients. And I'm sure, again, that if you were to think about it and consider some of the relationships you've had with clients, you can kind of maybe now recognise how that might have happened. And or when you've been able to develop trust, you know, bridging, you know, that gap with that client over and over and over, being that anchor, that tether, then that's when you're practising more and more of this co-regulation. And so that's when you might have been changing your tone of voice, you know, all of your verbal and non-verbal cues basically to your patient. And that can change their internal physiology and that can change your healing outcomes with their skin. And so, again, I'm not going to unpack the polyvagal theory now, but Stephen Porges, who I just mentioned before, he was the initiator of the conversations around it. And it's a really beautiful way to understand um, the nervous system. And this is a very simplified model, but you can kind of think of the, the nervous system. This is the autonomic nervous system as a ladder. And I'm again, I'm sure probably that um, all of us have been all the way up and all the way down this ladder just over the course of different times in our lifetime. So we've had moments, hopefully more than not, that of feeling safe and social and engaged and connected and curious. In those moments, we're really playful. Like we're like little kids. Like we're just kind of open, like rolling. We're like, yes, I'm going to do that. Yes, there's just much more spontaneity and fun. And I certainly know with the intense amount of adulting that I've been doing over the last, you know, couple of years handling COVID and businesses and you know farms and partnerships and all of that sort of stuff I haven't felt that anywhere near enough and so I have definitely been moving in these two stages of the ladder more often than I would like to be where I've been you know in that sympathetic um, activation fight flight or fawn mobilize aggressive frantic or in anxiety avoidance or like an internal panic which could actually manifest in like an outward kind of panic or if you're in dorsal vagal freeze or collapse often you don't even know you're heading there like you you can be rigid within this or you can be like full floppy but it's pretty immobile like you really just want to hop in under the doona and disappear and not really come out um, and some people this might happen at the onset of a migraine they can't move for three days but the body basically can shut you down and you don't really have much choice about it you've got zero energy um, so you feel pretty shut down helpless trapped disempowered there can be shame and depression that goes along with this it depends how long people stay in this but often people aren't even aware that they've moved into this involuntary freeze and collapse and it can be pretty hard to understand because if a lot of the time you were in oh my god I've just got to keep moving I've just got to get this done I've just got to get this done I've just got to get this done and you're just in full doing all over yourself mode it might be a little bit challenging to realise that when you get home and sit in front of Netflix for three hours and then hop straight into bed and you're not really talking to your partner or you're not really playing with your dogs or your kids or your care factor is really low, you, you are in a portion of freeze at that point. And so the awareness of the nervous system and the more awareness you have means that you can start taking half a step or one full step up a ladder at a time. And just so you know, you can't jump from freeze or collapse all the way up to ventral vagal like in an immediate way because at this particular point down here, the body physiology is actually being affected. So you're obviously going to have a lot more of a threat danger load in your body when you don't have enough nutrients. If your digestive system has been overwhelmed for a little while because you've been running so much, you haven't had time to digest food, even if you have been eating it. How's it going to get into your system when you're in flight mode the whole time? And so without the right amount of nutrients or without the right amount of like epigenetic activity. And again, I'm not going to break that down today, but things like methylation and acetylation, things that turn genes on or off or turn gene expression, like dial it all the way up or dial it all the way down. Things like that can um, be impacted greatly by like environmental exposures and nutrition and stress. And it can make it in almost impossible for a person to get out of freeze or collapse without an intervention from a naturopathic practitioner or an um, integrative doctor or someone who understands about that kind of physiology. Just FYI, I wanted to drop that in there. And so <clears throat> I 
I guess I also wanted to show this slide as well because I do think that there can be an enormous amount of pressure put on skin therapists sometimes when patients present to our clinics, especially if they've been to, you know, five or six or seven or more other therapists for their particular complaint that they're coming to you with. What that means is that we're often that client's last hope. However, their threat response is high. <laughs> their ability to trust is, is a little bit uh, more disengaged. And I think it's really important that we obviously take the time to kind of shake out the details of their, their case, like really getting their like detectives to work out what their underlying causative factors may be, but to also be able to listen to the deeper signals of the body and to be able to connect with them in that deep way so that they can build the trust to share with you the things that might be setting off their nervous system and therefore their immune system and their skin healing capabilities in a way that otherwise you might not be aware of. And so this slide, I think, makes it pretty easy to understand um, what can happen with our autonomic nervous system and how we can get we can move pretty quickly to overload or exhaustion. So we've got all of these different inputs coming into our body all the time, you know, taste, smell, vision, hearing, touch, energy, and emotions. And it's not just our own energy. Every time we are interacting with any other object or person in our environment, we are interacting with energy in some way, shape, or form. And it's either going to uh, resonate with us or create a dissonance and a lack of coherence and a lack of harmony within us. But then we've got life. So we've got, you know, like chronic stress and daily stress, the unpredictability of life. We've got our own belief systems, you know, the goggles in which we see the world, like the filters. Um, we can have things like dehydration, just general food intake, like the quality and quantity of your food, when you're eating, how you're eating, where you're eating, um, and like what happens in your digestive system with all the signaling that that entails. What are your sleep patterns like, the quality and quantity of your sleep? What has been your level of previous trauma? And the more trauma we've had stacked onto us, you know, over the course of our lives, and that could be, you know, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual trauma, the easier it is for lack of resilience to come in. So we can have too much happening too fast. We can have too little happening for too long. So too little nourishment, too little looking after, or way, like all of a sudden, I don't know, you might be running a business and but for different reasons, two staff members leave, you're, you're sick and something else happens and it's just like, oh my gosh, how can I even survive this? And you might just not have enough resources to move through it at that point. That is a critical point. And so it depends on what your resources are like in your body as to what your perception of those events are going to be. So all of us will have a choice point at kind of this bit where we can feel overstimulation and discomfort. And this takes a lot of learning. I spent, you know, how old am I? I turned 44 this year. So I spent, God, probably since birth, I'm going to say nearly 44 years, probably being in overstimulation um, and discomfort or sensory fatigue and overriding self. And I, it took me, it's taken me a long time to learn my choice point where all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, I'm riding this wave here. What do I do to... What do I need to do to release the charge, deactivate to self-soothe? How can I create safety in my body again where it can trust me in the decisions that I'm making? Am I choosing myself as sacred or am I choosing everybody else as more sacred than me, like amplifying the fact that deep down I've got an issue with my sense of worth or deservingness or enoughness? That's going to be driving the stress response that's going to make my nervous system feel contracted and tight and unavailable for healing. And so I've got to increase resources and that often means changing my environment. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of us need some alone time to really fully recharge. And a lot of us need some proper sleep, some really good sleep. And sometimes there are specific amino acids or other nutrients that might be required to really help people get over the line there. And so I wanted to put this slide in just to kind of just see how quickly we can swing with our nervous system. So, you know, with all of these different middle points, you know, like there's a, there's a beautiful kind of swing, like we can pendulate, um, you know, with communication limit setting, but we can also swing way too far and actually move into full conflict avoiding, like running away from the situation, people pleasing, where again, where we're denying our own needs 
or we can end up being really judgmental, really defensive, really controlling, really micromanaging. And you can look at all of these different aspects, you know, to do with power. Like we can move into um, assertiveness and cooperation with care. We can move into caring or self-care with our social strength. We can move into being really genuine and authentic and having social confidence with strength. We can be centered. We can just be strong, present, grounded. With trust, there can be a sense of perceptiveness. And then we're going to have these, you know, far left or the far right where if we're holding on to more often than not suspicion, anger, if we're um, really being a chameleon and holding up lots of masks and different personalities, or if we're kind of narcissistic and feeling self-absorbed or entitled or superior, um, if we're just constantly needing to be a rebel, like we know we need to do something, but oh my God, there's a part of me that just wants to fight against that all the time or have something to say or always has to say the last word um, or that passive aggressive behavior, just little digs you know, microaggression, um, or if all you're doing all the time is taking care of others and you're really self-effacing, underneath that will always be some disowned anger and grief. Um, and all of those aspects of self, all the things that I've just said, are, are like they're parts of every single person. Like none of us are alone in exploring all of these different parts of ourselves, but continuing to hold an unawareness of them or an unwillingness to look at these different parts of ourselves means that there's a part of our nervous system that is expending a huge amount of energy holding that away from our awareness because we're trying to lock it behind, you know, energetic doors um, in our mind and in our body. And so our cells, our tissues, our organ systems are holding on to that energy. And that obviously creates a lack of flow and a lack of nutrients. You know, I, I did a post a little while ago where I was talking about the issues in our tissues <laughs> and it is the, it's the, the disowned issues, the suppressed, repressed, denied, disavowed issues um, that are going to be part of that. And if none of us have ever learned how to really like create safety in our nervous system and then support our nervous system, we don't feel safe enough to feel what it's like to move into knowing these parts of ourselves, like to form a relationship with the disowned anger parts of ourselves. Like for a lot of people, it's too scary to even consider or the disowned grief parts of ourselves. They're like, oh my gosh, if I really tapped into that, that deep layer of hurt or betrayal or whatever it is that might be um, behind that grief, I think it's going to overwhelm me and I'm not going to be able to go there. Well, what would happen if you just took really small steps towards letting your body know that at some point in the future, you're going to be resourced enough to integrate and finally process some of those different um, traumatic experiences that your body has held onto you for, because at the time that it happened or at the multiple times that it happened, your body wasn't in a position to be able to process it or integrate it properly. Therefore, it's not able to heal it. And that layer of blocking is going to be blocking healing, you know, from the skin to within way. I hope that that makes sense. And I did want to just drop in a slide here just about adverse childhood experiences because this is absolutely related to um, all sorts of health outcomes, you know, from psychiatric disorders, anxiety, depression, to, you know, much more um, full-on things like schizophrenia and bipolar, um, you know, all the way through to all types of addictions, at least... Uh, what are the percentages? So 60% of adults have experienced at least one of these and about 25% of the population have experienced three or more. And that's just in the, the studies that they have done on this. There is quite a lot of studies on ACEs and it is a little bit controversial because it doesn't look at all the different dynamics of all the different things that are happening. This slide's one of the best ones that I have found. Um, I mean, I have added a couple of different points here too. I mean, if any of us... I often look after clients that consider that they had a pretty, um, in inverted commas, normal childhood. But when I dive a little bit deeper into it, um, you know, one of the clients that I looked after, um, she came to me after seeing many, many different practitioners. She's got a huge amount of um, inflammation running through her entire spinal column. Like her MRIs are really significant. And as a child, she was just never, I mean, she felt loved, but no one actually said those words out loud to her. And so it seems like it's a big thing to hear as an adult, yet as a small child, she just placed that somewhere in her body and most likely in her spine, <laughs> in that sympathetic nervous system. Like that's very much related to her sympathetic nervous system and her central nervous system. 
And so there is a level of, you know, shame or guilt or patriarchy or misogyny, so many other factors in our cultural, society, education realms that can really inform us of who we are. We just kind of apply different beliefs that are just not the truth of who we are. Um, and if you look at all the kids growing up now, look at the social media, the, the norms of social media, the expectations of social media, it's so full on. <laughs> They've got so much to deal with. And so I'm not going to unpack this slide because I could do a whole other, you know, probably three hour presentation just on this. Um, but it does give you an indication of just so much that happens. Like bullying, bullying at school is so commonplace, so commonplace. I mean, I very rarely have met someone where bullying didn't happen to them at some degree or at some point in their life. Um, and definitely emotional neglect in childhood, like a misattunement is really common. So parents carrying their own nervous system dysregulation, their own levels of trauma, their own inability to meet um, these suppressed emotions that are then <laughs> doing their best to connect with their kids from that place. And there is always going to be a little level of disconnection, separation. The kid takes that up into their field and for whatever reasons, because of their unique life experiences, they can amplify it. And so this can be really intergenerational and that's why it can just keep going and going and going until someone in the family decides to put their hand up and say, hey, I'm prepared to communicate with my nervous system and listen to the information that's in there and do my best to resource it in a different way. And this is kind of, <laughs> there's a lot of arrows going a lot of different places, but this is the interwining of how we can get so vulnerable to all different types of issues, like this is in our body and how it can affect our self-regulatory capacity, our resiliency, our ability to connect. And it's not to say that anyone going through any of the ACEs can't build resiliency and ability to connect. It's just that there's generally a, a more awareness or um, more attunement to do with epigenetic changes and the level of toxic stress and allostatic load. Like there's so many individual circumstances. Everyone does have a unique history and a unique story that does need to be looked at to work out what level do each of these arrows, what's happening inside of you to create um, changes in your self-regulatory capacity or your vulnerability to dis-ease. And so when I, I often... You know, I, I often look after very complex client places and everyone that I um, meet on my consult form, they have to answer about an hour's worth of questions before we even sit down. But everyone ticks the boxes that lets me know that they're undergoing like a lot of kind of um, brain fog, mental fatigue. They've got memory impairment. Like there's a lot happening in their body and their brain is like, I can't even think for normal tasks, let alone for doing complex information. And so... If someone's at that level and if you're looking after them as a practitioner, even if you're looking after them for a facial, all they need is safety. They need safety first. They don't need um, lectures. They don't need a huge amount of information. They don't, like they're not looking to, um, you know, make their brain work even harder. They're just looking to feel safe and secure and we can provide that. And then gently, 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 as they start looking after some of the epigenetic changes and the levels of stress and adversity and those sort of things, then their body is going to have more capacity. And I did want to bring this into your awareness as well, because I just find it so fascinating. So Carl Jung has this archetype that I think is relevant for all people working in the healthy and healing professions. And you may or may not have heard of it before. Um, it's like the, the wounded healer. So we are the healer and we're the wounded all at once. And Without any realisation that both aspects are parts of us, it's a really easy thing to project our still hurting woundedness onto the other. Um, and it can happen, you know, like in a team, it can happen with clients, it can happen outside of work. Um, on the flip side, if we over-identify as a healer, we can become blind to the healer that's present in our clients or the people around us. It's not just our clients. And we risk amplifying feelings of superiority or the fact that we're so needed and that will always create separation. And this is all working at a really unconscious level, obviously. And that's why I wanted to bring it to your attention because once you've sown a little seed of information, this is all just, this presentation is just about sowing seeds. Like what resonates with you? What do you feel like you need to learn more about? What does your body feel safe enough and resource to learn a little bit more about? How can you take some small steps into 
working with your system in a way that feels really good for you. And yeah, it might take you out of your comfort zone. Like you're not going to keep growing if you stay in your comfort zone, but it's about not stretching into the panic zone. It's about just taking steps out of your comfort zone and constant, consistently kind of stretching that boundary. And all of a sudden you've moved into a really different place without having taken one huge step and moved fully into panic zone and freaking yourself out. <laughs> um, and so this is that showing up for ourselves is learning how to regulate our own nervous system. And that's how we get to tend to our own wounding. That's how we can continue to work really well in the healing profession, like with vitality and also continue to recognize the healer in the other, like become even more appreciative of our clients, become even more grateful of that person sitting in front of us. Like they are a divine light. They also might be triggering us. Oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that curious? I wonder what's going on for me. How can I regulate myself in this moment? How can I offer them regulation? And how can I come back to this later so that I can work out what's going on for me? And we are very vulnerable to the continuous stirring up of our woundedness by the problems our clients bring to us without a doubt. And again, this could be happening on a very unconscious level, but we're going to be... Um, attracting people into our life that there is going to be stories and themes behind a lot of those incidences behind a lot of those meeting points behind a lot of those conversations that when you start asking yourself more questions you will really find some patterns that you can relate to your own healing journey your own expansion journey and I love this quote by John Prendick it is true that we are all affected by our conditioning, by our imperfect parenting, by neglect, by abuse, by trauma, by unhealthy attachment styles, by the challenges of life itself. However, and this is critically important, we are never essentially damaged by these experiences. On a relative level, we are impacted, sometimes quite deeply. On an essential level, we are not. As human beings, we are always both wounded and whole. And I love wholeness. And I found this paper by Moyo et al, Healthcare Practitioners Personal and Professional Values 2016, that looked at the personal and professional values of healthcare practitioners influencing their, their clinical decisions um, and patient-centered care and decision-making and the way it worked within interprofessional teams. The most prominent values identified were altruism, equality, and capability. And I've got down here, altruism means you have a willingness to do things that bring advantages to others, even if it means resulting in disadvantage for yourself. And I think that's really huge. So if you've already got a dysregulated nervous system, if you're holding on to, you know, some level of trauma from a level of adverse child experiences or, you know, maternal stress, or there's so many different aspects to our lives that we might be aware of or not aware of that could be increasing the threat response in our body. Do you think it would be easier to continue making decisions in a work capacity that would result in disadvantage in yourself? I do think so. If our nervous system is dysregulated, is it, does it feel a little bit harder to reach into full equality? I do think so because there's a sense of separateness when our nervous system is dysregulated. It's much, much harder to engage and connect deeply and capability. If our nervous system is dysregulated, then our inner resources are kind of tapped out. We're either in fight or flight and fawn mode or we're in collapse and freeze mode. And what are our capabilities really truly then? We don't have that same expanded perspective. We don't have that creativity to problem solve when our inner resources are tapped out or if we're hiding from the world because we actually just do not have any more resources anymore. And that's why this trauma and adversity lens, I think, is really important to bring to these sort of conversations because you can say these things. They, they sound great. Living them, though, living them truthfully, authentically, that, that comes about when we know our nervous system and have created a relationship with our nervous system to work out how we can um, have a willingness to do things for others that brings advantages to both them and you, you know, in a great way where we are kind of on this equality platform when we are feeling capable and vital and resourced. And if you've ever noticed feeling a loss of identity, a loss of purpose, a loss of sense of who you are, where you belong and what you're supposed to be doing, that is definitely related to a level of trauma and dysregulation in your nervous system. And you don't have to stay in that place. And that's what learning, or if you have a client that's in this place, that, that's what this knowledge is so important for. And our true nature is literally to be connected. The most fundamental lifelong needs are connection and authenticity. And we have to find it in ourselves first. 
And the simplest definition of trauma is broken connections. And they do make you less flexible, less available, more rigid, with less feeling and being more defensive. And that's on a physical, emotional, mental or spiritual realm. And trauma is not the actual event, you know, like it's, it is the experience of some type of threat. And it's about the individual perception of the event when there was an overwhelming of our inner resources. And that could be on a physical, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual level. You know, if we don't have enough nutrients that, that help us fight a level of, you know, full inflammation that happened at, at a particular experience, we don't have the inner resources to help you heal from that event. And that can lead to disconnection, isolation, immobilization. That dysregulates the optimal functioning of our body in, on all dimensions. Every single person is going to experience a traumatic event differently because of that. They're going to make different meanings out of it because of that. They're going to create different beliefs around it because they are unique, because it's their system that had the experience. And that's why trauma cannot be measured. And it's just the same as everyone having unique DNA sequence and unique bodies with different shapes and sizes. We also have different ways that our full body, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, processes emotional experiences. But we know that ongoing emotional dysregulation will interfere with our capacity for intimacy. So whether that's looking after clients, for even wanting clients, for attracting clients, for having them continue to work with you, for wanting to be a boss, for wanting to lead a team, for wanting to be a team member, for even parenting, for meaningful friendships, you know, like there's so many influences happening all the time because of that. And as we heal, we've got so much more energy being liberated for our life and for being in the present moment. All of these aspects of self can be impacted by any of the experiences that you've ever had. And to really live on purpose, to live with a commitment to yourself, to live with a continual kind of empowered vulnerability to meet yourself, there does need to be an understanding of the connection between all of these points of self. And the connection point is our nervous system. It is the master regulator of all of these systems and that's why I really wanted to share this information with you today because I do believe our nervous system is the key to a really good life so I do have a course um, I know that um, I, hopefully Vital Plus will share this afterwards but you will get a $50 discount off my course price it's valid until next Friday the 8th of the 4th and this course is over, I don't know, I think it's six and a half hours and there's experiential learning lessons. Um, it is designed to help you understand how to connect with your own um, nervous system in a way that's really powerful. And you also have the cognitive learning sections. Like there is a lot of information here and even at the $1.99 price, I think it's so cheap. And I made it that way because I wanted it to be so accessible to people. So the investment for me, like it, it was huge and I'm really proud to offer it at this price point because I feel like it's going to help so many people and I would love you to be one of those people. And I think the impact that you could have if you learnt this information for your people, the ripple effects just keep growing and flowing. I listened really well and so no, thank you beautiful. for listening and for being present and okay. for being available. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.